Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. I am here with Grom, Grommy Ravenscroft, and I think I just messed that first part of that name up. Tell, tell, tell me, is it is it Graham? It is, yep. Graham, okay. Graham Ravenscroft, uh, who is the technical marketing engineer for Arista. Welcome, Graham. Good morning, good afternoon, etc. Thank you for having me. <laughs> awesome. So, where 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 are you at in the, in the world today? I am uh, just outside of Denver, Colorado. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, I am in South Carolina, so a little bit far from you. But you know, I, are you affected with this uh, cold spell that the nation, most of the nation, is getting? You know, I think we got it first. Um, I think okay. that weather typically tends to travel sort of west to east uh, in this country, and so it was unusually unseasonally cold uh, for a couple of days, early, kind of earlier in the week and over the weekend. Um, things are evening okay. out now. I think it's it's supposed to be about 75 here today. Oh, that's beautiful. 75 in Colorado. And I want to say it was uh, 40 degrees when I woke up this morning in South Carolina. So we've always got the hot and the humidity and all that that's a bear for us. So. For sure. Um, the weather yeah. here is interesting because it's a desert. So okay. we have huge temperature swings, right? So, I mean, it was 35 when I got out of bed this morning, too. And then we're going to see probably 75 or 80 this afternoon. Okay. Neat, neat. Well, Welcome to Colorado weather at its finest then. So awesome. So uh, you are the technical marketing engineer for Arista. Now, a lot of folks may not have heard of Arista, but Arista actually just went through the rebranding to, to for Arista, but you were Untangle, correct? We were, yep. Um, okay. So Untangle originally started somewhere around 2007, I want to say, um, okay. our founder was a Cisco guy. And if anybody's ever worked with Cisco devices, they're notoriously difficult to configure. And his <laughs> thought was basically, there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, sure. So set about developing his own kind of uh, firewall routing uh, UTM solution. And uh, fast forward, you know, 10, 11 years, I started working with Untangle in 2018, uh, originally as a member of the support team. So just fixing stuff when it broke. Okay. Um, and uh, worked with the support team for about three years before getting moved into my current position. And then uh, we were acquired by Arista, who are a, um, it, they're surprisingly not super well known, I'm given to understand, um, which is weird because they're a Cisco competitor. They are, or we okay. are, I should say. Um, we are um, kind of a full service, uh, a full featured networking products company um, up until very recently, their focus had been largely on uh, switching. Okay. So they provide okay. a lot of like really enormous enterprise level, like, you know, 200 gigabit, 400 gigabit switching um, for data centers and cloud operations and things like that. Um, and so they had focused kind of a lot on that networking, um, networking equipment. Okay. And then getting into access points and everything. And they have some of the best, um, honestly, some, you know, obviously I would say this, but um, <laughs> some, some of the best yeah, uh, wireless access points that I've come across. Okay. And then they they picked us up uh, with the intention of expanding their kind of security portfolio a little bit. So we are uh, Untangle. We're a much more edge focused. Um, we didn't really do switching stuff. We did security um, and content filtering and uh, UTM, a unified threat management device. Okay. And so they picked us up to kind of expand that uh, that sector of their business. Okay. And well, that was a good call on their part. So I know Untangle has a very, very good name behind it. Uh, I think you and I were talking about this just before we went live. Um, you know, Untangle has done such a great job at promoting their brand, Untangle. Now it's kind of like, what's Arista? Oh, wait, that's Untangle. So, yeah, it's... Um, it, it, it's it's interesting, but uh, I, I guess that does, that happens a lot when you know mergers and acquisitions. Uh, it's it's very difficult to probably you know get everybody on their radar that hey, this is a new this is the same company or whatever. But oh, absolutely. Um, and you know, as you pointed out, it's definitely a process getting the branding updated and everything. Um, figuring out the relationship between a company that used to be a standalone company and is now sort of a division of something is a is a whole other thing. Um. Yeah, but it's been it's been a pretty good ride so far. I have no complaints about it. So, well, good deal. Well, you've been a, 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 a an employee there for a long time now with Arista, but uh, you said since 2018, right? Is when you started with Untangle. I have. Yep, um, okay. I started with Untangle uh, May. I want to say of 2018. So just about four okay. and a half years. Congrats! Congrats! That's thank awesome. You, thank you. So, what is, what is one of the 
what is one of your favorite things that you could say that lit, that makes you want to keep staying there at uh, Arista? What's one of the things that about the company that you really like working there? There is um, there is a really great culture here. I think that that's okay. something that um, everybody says about their employer, uh, obviously. <laughs> but um, we have been um, Untangle. We're we're very much a startup, right? Um, and okay. we were, we were a very small company. There were 52 employees, I think at the time of the acquisition. Um, and so we were all pretty tightly knit. Everybody kind of knew who everybody was and it was, um, we were all pretty, we were pretty close, I guess, as it were. Um, and then, you know, we were, we were picked up by Arista, which has something like 3000 employees, um, oh, very wow. large. Yeah. Very, very large company. So we were, I think a lot of us were initially concerned, like, how is this going to work from a culture perspective, you know, is, um, are we going to like, just kind of disappear in this, in this huge, uh, huge pile of people, you know? Um, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And, uh, but everyone, everyone that we have worked with, um, has been so welcoming and so excited about our products, which is really interesting, which is really cool. Um, I'm, I, I would hate for us to have been picked up and everyone to go, oh, we don't care, you know, but I have, <laughs> um, it's, it's been, um, March, I think was when we, when we officially sort of merged. Um, okay. and started working with everyone. And so I have been doing, uh, demos very similar to this, um, to varying levels of kind of technical depth, um, all the time, constantly, uh, since then okay. trying to train some of their sales teams or their sales engineering teams, or, you know, kind of their support people. Um, it has always been one of my responsibilities to do these kinds of demos, uh, typically for particular end users, whether they were people who might be considering, um, becoming a partner with Untangle or just, you know, potential users, things like that. Um, just sure. take some time out and kind of show them the device and see it, you know, and how everything works. Um, so I have done a ton of that and everyone has been super receptive, um, have been <clears> super <throat> positive about it. And I mean, I'm, there's not a day that goes by that I don't have people popping in, in, you know, four or five different <laughs> communication methods saying, Hey, I'm installing this product. Can you help me with it? Or like, I'm excited to learn about it, whatever. Um, so that has been really great. The sort of enthusiasm um, awesome. and everyone's just been super welcoming. It's been, it's been really nice. Well, that's exciting. Cause I am looking forward to diving in deep and getting an excellent demo from you today of the Arista platform. Well, I will do so. my best. <laughs> well, shall we get started? Absolutely. Let me just present my screen here <clears throat> Okay. and we will get into it. Perfect. All right. So um, our little subset of Arista is called Arista ETM or Edge Threat Management, um, which is kind of our, our purview. And our product uh, portfolio consists of three pieces. We've got ETM dashboard. Um, anyone who might be familiar with the old Untangle products knew it as Command Center. Uh, this is our kind of centralized management, portfo uh, centralized management platform where we can do kind of a lot of stuff, um, both with our accounts, subscriptions, things like that, as well as kind of management of some of our appliances. Uh, and then the two actual products are going to be uh, the NG Firewall, which is our flagship. It's um, it's our biggest and best. It's got all the buttons, uh, all the bells and whistles and everything. Um, and it's kind of younger sibling, uh, what we call Micro Edge, which is a very lightweight um, edge routing device that has some kind of streamlined capacities and is largely intended for kind of a distributed enterprise type of situation. Um, okay. Generally speaking, we would have like a large NG firewall at your headquarters and then micro edge appliances at kind of your branch offices. So your, your smaller uh, locations or somewhere where there's only five people and you don't want to have a full sized um, firewall in place. <clears throat> so we can kind of offload some of that filtering capacity to that central NG firewall and centralized management, centralized, you know, reports data and monitoring and all of that stuff. Okay. So that's kind of the general overview of the product uh, portfolio, as it were. Um our uh, our overall moniker is Q, uh, Cognitive Unified Edge, and these ETM products are part of what we uh, the Q portfolio, which also includes um, wireless access points as well as wired uh, switching hardware. Okay. And I have to admit to a deficiency in knowledge when it comes to those particular parts. Um, those are the those are the parts that we kind of got from. Uh, the Arista side of the house, and I don't know them as well as possible to be able to really speak to them uh, super cog super competently. Um, but thankfully, I do know the ETM product portfolio pretty well. So okay, okay, fair enough. Um, so with that said, what we're looking at here, this is our ETM dashboard. This is, like I said, our centralized management uh, platform. 
So once we sign into it, we get this dashboard, which shows us kind of a heads up view of the, the fleet as a whole. So you can see the map there. It's got all these locations. These are physical appliances, or these are the locations of individual appliances, right? So okay. we have, this one is actually not in, uh, not physically in Puerto Rico. It's in our Santa Clara office. Um, but obviously you can show, you can kind of edit the, um, the location that's displayed for these things. And so these show you your, you know, your, your uh, appliances, the locations of all of them as well as we've got this list here, which is kind of the same thing. This shows us all of the appliances associated with this account. And this is our demo account. So it has uh, just a number of um, kind of dummy appliances that are in here that can be used for various purposes. Okay. And then some other just kind of heads up information. So if uh, there are some alerts that have been delivered um, from some of these devices, we see those here, as well as some kind of uh, collated information from the network as a whole. So when we look at, for example, this widget, top applications by bandwidth, this collates this particular report, top applications by bandwidth for all of our devices and then combines them together. So what you're seeing here is kind of an overhead view of the whole, of all of our appliances, our whole, um, our whole fleet of devices. Okay, now is that for all Arista customers or just what, what this dashboard is controlling? It's just this account. So this okay. dashboard uh, is, so we can click on here. You can see this is the Untangled Demo, Demo Gmail sure. account. Um, okay. Yep. And so this is this is one specific account. Um, and like I said, this is where we can manage like subscriptions and stuff. So your your ETM dashboard account is roughly synonymous with kind of what we're looking at here. Okay. Um, but yep, this is the heads up view of all of the particular appliances. And we can skip over to the appliances view here and see all of those individual um, so each of these is a particular device. Um, so okay. we've got, for example, there's an, this, uh, this is an AWS hosted um, okay. NG firewall. So we can deploy NG firewall um, to a public cloud like AWS or Azure. Um, okay. We can also deploy it in a physical appliance. Uh, let me find one like this Z20. I was going to ask you, that's pretty interesting. So that would be a SaaS appliance. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Um, okay. Yep. So uh, yeah, those those are we have actually a surprising number of um, deployments that are that are okay. essentially entirely cloud centric. So obviously you have to have something at the physical location that routes traffic to it, but the firewall doesn't have to be in the room. Um, so okay. as long as you can get traffic from each of these locations, or even if you've only got the one, you can still have this SaaS style um, cloud hosted firewall. Okay, interesting. Um, so yep, there are those options. We like I said, we have um, confirmed deployments, and we have. Uh, you know, uh, official images uh, with both AWS and Azure. Um, we're testing on some other things. I know there's a Google, a Google Cloud platform uh, that we're trying to test on as well as kind of some other things to give people more options for those, um, those cloud hosted uh, deployments. But we've also got the physical hardware. So again, the one we're looking at here, this is our Z20 um, or Q20, and that's our enterprise level um, appliance. It's, it's pretty beefy. It's got like a six core, uh, six core Xeon chip, like 32 gigs of RAM, um, nice. 20, 20 physical ports. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty beefy. And then that, um, the, the hardware appliances run the gamut down to our Z4, which is just a little, um, fanless desktop style. Um, this is great for like a home environment or a small office. Uh, we usually rate this one okay. for up to, up to 20 to 30 users probably. And we assume um, we assume three devices per user. Um, so about a hundred devices, give or take, should be able to be um, just fine with this, with this Z4. Okay. And then, uh, like I said, just a kind of the gamut uh, all the way from that enterprise, all the way down to this, um, this very lightweight appliance here. Um, so yep, there's our, our listing of, um, our listing of all of our appliances and from, let me grab a useful one here. Um, and so from this page, we get a little bit more information about this specific device, right? This particular box. Um, so okay. we've got the, the UID that um, that identifies it or identifies the software. It's basically a serial number for the software as well as the hardware for the hardware serial number. That appliance map location, uh, this one, apparently someone decided it's in Solon, Ohio. So um, <laughs> again, it's, it's physically in, uh, I want to say it's in our golden office uh, here outside of Denver. Okay. But you can edit that location. Um, and then we get some information about it. So there's the resource usage there, um, recent hosts. These are devices passing traffic through it. So we can kind of see that. The licenses that are associated with it, um, any alerts that have been sent by this particular device. And we'll get into what that means a little bit later on. Um, okay. And then some information, some kind of information about it. And these particular reports, obviously they're a little bit bare. Um, because it's a demo environment, there's not actual traffic passing through it, which is why these are blank. 
Okay. But these widgets are um, the specific versions of the ones that we saw over on the dashboard. So these are particular to just this particular appliance. Okay. Um, and I don't recall if there's one of these that actually has some traffic passing through it. Let me see if I can find something. So it's, well, maybe not. Okay. Um, and the other, the other cool feature here is going to be this cloud backups option um, where we can pull a backup uh, configuration backup from the device or restore it right here from ETMD. So you don't have to nice. be in a room with it. Yep. You don't have to do anything with it. If I need to restore a backup to this device from yesterday, for example, I can just click this restore backup button. It'll push um, that collection of settings and, and, you know, essentially revert it back to its state uh, yesterday. Nice. So again, the convenience of not having to, you know, be in the room with it and, and have to touch it in order to, um, in order to do anything like that. And then some basic options for it. Uh, remove appliance does what it sounds like. It removes it from the account. Um, reboot, you can either do an automatic, uh, a reboot now on demand, or you can schedule a reboot if you want to set it, you know, to happen at a particular time outside of business hours or whatever you might have. Okay. Update software is very similar. Um, this is going to check for updates. And if there is an update available for this device, then we're going to apply it. And you can either do the update now option, which is just on demand, or you can schedule that. Um, same as, uh, same as those reboot settings. And the update software thing is interesting because this can be configured from both ends. I can configure this option both here in ETM dashboard, or I can configure it in the individual appliance itself. And uh, if there is a conflict, the appliance setting wins. So I really like the schedule because a lot of times you don't want to, you, you know, you need to update a, an appliance on site, but you don't want to, you know, mess the end users up. You don't want to reboot their network while they're in the middle of their job. So you could reschedule it, schedule that update to take effect, you know, at three o'clock in the morning when the user's not actively using the network. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, because of the kind of versatility of NG Firewall, we're deployed in a lot of different kinds of environments, right? Okay. Um, one of the one of the places where we have been really successful is education, schools. Schools love us. Um, okay. Part of that is just kind of the features that we have. Um, our, our web filter application is honestly one of the best in class. It's one of the best um, web filter applications that there is amongst you know competitors and things. And so obviously schools, that's really important. Uh, they have <laughs> compliance with SIPA regulations. They have, you know, they have to protect kids from questionable sure. content, I guess. Um, and so you, we do really well in education, but obviously if uh, the way that the world is now, um, there is such a dependency on kind of like external resources and everything. Uh, it's not every kid has a book in the classroom anymore. Now they've got computers that need connections to YouTube. They need connections to outside services, learning portals, things like that. Um, so obviously if we update the device in the middle of the day and the students lose connectivity, they lose a bunch of you know time. And then you've got to um, you know, corral a room full of kids who can't do their work. Sure. So absolutely, you know, set it to set it to update at seven at night or two o'clock in the morning. Um, retail business is another one where you see a lot of that. Schedule it when the business is closed, and then there's no impact to um, operations. Okay. Yep. So those are super handy. Um, moving on a little bit, add license does what it sounds like. Uh, it will open this pane, which will display any licenses which are available in the account that can be assigned, and we can just assign this subscription directly to it right through this, uh, right through this page. Okay. Label gives us this friendly name. So you see this, uh, this is the host name of the device drawn from the device itself. So this dot arista, uh, networks.com name is pulled from the, the hardware. And then okay. we've given it the, the label Z12 demo. So like a friendly name, and you can set this to whatever makes sense for you. Um, for MSPs, I see a lot of them where they'll say, you know, this is the, um, you know, tire shop on main street, or this is such and such a location or whatever. So that when you're looking at the list of appliances here, these names aren't clients. necessarily meaningful. Exactly. Yep. Right. So then you can just look at these labels and see exactly what, um, which ones you're looking at. Okay. Very nice. And then remote access. Um, we will get to that one in a minute, but if I click on this, this takes me directly to the UI for this particular device. So any okay. configurational changes that I need to make in it, I can do so, um, not directly in ETM dashboard, but I have a pathway from ETM dashboard right to the particular appliance. Okay. And then one of the other things I usually like to cover uh, here in ETM dashboard is our networks feature. Um, this allows you to create a subset of your appliances. So you see in this particular network, Acme Auto Parts, um, we've got just five appliances. So these are now kind of grouped okay. together into this network. And uh, we can see the listing of them here. And this gives us a couple of interesting um, abilities and a couple of interesting sort of pieces of information. Uh, one is going to be this network performance um, graph, which will show us the network performance of all of the micro edge appliances. Um, 
Micro Edge has really cool intelligent uh, routing features for uh, for WAN use. And uh, one of the things that it does is it tests each of those WANs um, constantly, effectively. And it's looking for, as you see there, jitter latency packet loss. So we're looking for those features on those particular WAN connections. And then this network performance widget will show us um, kind of aggregate uh, results of those tests for all of the micro edge appliances we see. And then it just kind of averages them together. Um, so we can see, you know, at a glance, whether the network as a whole is experiencing a lot of packet loss or whether it has really, uh, really bad latency, whatever it might be. Okay. Okay. And then uh, MicroEdge also has uh, WAN rules, which are essentially how we treat your traffic, how we use, uh, how we send your outgoing traffic through your WANs, your WAN connections. Um, generally, uh, you'll only see that in um, multi-WAN type of environments, right? Um, someplace okay. that has more than one internet connection. Um, but short version here is that if you would like to sync your WAN rules, you can sync them to the entire network right here with one with one click just sync rules to appliances and it will push all of these rules to every micro edge that's nice. part of this network yep so we can set that rule up once and we don't have to go into each one and turn it on and and uh configure those rules and so on it's so a time forth. saver it is absolutely um and we're definitely working on um you know kind of expanding that that theme that concept a little bit to have a lot more kind of centralized management capacity here in etm dashboard so that again you don't have to touch every device in your network um, to get them all kind of synced together configurationally okay but Thanks. the real party piece here i like is this software defined networks feature this is um this is very similar to uh, the cisco auto vpn feature and it allows us to create a mesh vpn network uh with within this network with any or all of these devices with like three clicks. So I can pick, this is gonna be the sort of the donor um, unit. I click configuration and all I gotta do is pick the uh, the endpoint address. So the external IP address that's associated with it that the VPNs are gonna connect to. And we can either set it to automatic and leave it alone, or we can specify one if I wanna use a different address. And then we pick the subnets located behind this device that need to be shared to the other devices in the VPN. And then I click save. Push this, uh, push this configuration, sync VPN settings, and it will automatically create uh, WireGuard VPN tunnels to all the selected appliances, push the configuration, turn everything on, and it actually disables other VPNs that are that might cause conflicts with uh, this new VPN setup. So a couple of clicks, get yourself a mesh VPN network set up um, in seconds, literally. Nice. So you could actually print between different offices if you needed to. On different yes, subnets. Abs yeah, absolutely. So you could you can set up kind of a whole, um, you know, if you're standing up five five offices, for example, um, you can connect all of them right here through this, you know, again, with one click. Um, okay. And then all of those offices can access one another. You know, everybody can use, if there's a printer that everybody prefers that, you know, maybe it's an HQ or something. Um, sure. Yeah, you can print like that uh, network resources. So you can share uh, retail environments that might want to share like customer information or customer account details, things like that. Just share yeah, that nice. stuff automatically to everywhere. Um, yeah, absolutely. So this is a really cool feature um, and okay. we're, we're pretty excited about that one. Um, and then just very briefly, alerts. Um, we have kind of two different kinds of alerts here. So these are notifications that we're going to send to you when something happens, right? Some of them are going to be generated by ECM dashboard itself, and that's going to cover things like um, user profile changes. So someone has changed the uh, credentials or has changed the account in some way, uh, changed mm -hmm. the billing address, changed that, kind of, that sort of information. Purchase events, somebody bought a subscription or somebody canceled a subscription, um, a signing of subscriptions, things like this that are covered by the ECM dashboard itself. Okay. So it can send those alerts, and then we can also send alerts from particular appliances themselves. So this high memory usage alert is generated by a particular NG firewall, and then it sends that alert to ETM dashboard, which gives us some more uh, kind of delivery options. Uh, so by default, the NG firewall will email these alerts uh, directly, but that's the only delivery method for those alerts through the, uh, the NG firewall. Okay. Here in ETM dashboard, we've got these notification profiles, which you can set up and you can change the delivery method. So Email is obviously the default. Um, we can deliver an alert to a webhook if you've got uh, like an API that can ingest incoming um, alert, you know, type information, notification type information, and do whatever you need to do with it. We can also send alerts to Slack, PagerDuty, and Victor Ops systems, as well as our Untangle Go mobile application, which nice. essentially allows you to trigger those alerts from the NG firewall as a push notification on your mobile device. Okay. Pretty convenient. Um, big fan of that. 
And then uh, just some kind of high level information um, about the, the network as a whole. Um, this hosts viewer shows us all of the hosts that are downstream of any appliance anywhere in the network. And it's pretty broad spectrum, obviously. Um, it gives us a ton of information, not all of which is, is necessarily all that useful in a lot of cases, but the kind of cool feature here is we can integrate ETM dashboard with enterprise level uh, Bitdefender, Malwarebytes, and uh, Webroot antivirus. Okay. So then I can go into this device here and I can start an antivirus scan right here from ETM dashboard. And that will send the command to this particular uh, PC. It looks like a, an engineering PC for our cloud team. Um, and it will send that command for that device to run its antivirus scan um, automatically without us having to tell a user, you know, please run a virus scan or schedule something through the device itself. You know, if we suspect that there might be an issue with this device, we can just run that scan ourselves directly here, which is pretty, uh, pretty convenient. Nice. Policies allow us to sync configurations from uh, a donor appliance to uh, target appliances. Um, there are kind of two pieces to this. One is going to be this template configuration option, which is basically a system snapshot. This is going to be all of the settings in the device with the exception of like WAN settings, things that would uh, require it, uh, ISP settings so that it can connect to the internet. Um, but it's everything else, um, all of your filter settings, all your application settings, um, essentially, you know, everything about the device. And then we will sync it from device A to devices B, C, and D, or whatever you specify. Okay. Um, so this can be use useful for, as the name suggests, a template, right? Uh, if you are an MSP who wants to have a kind of base configuration that you apply to your devices before you send them out to your um, your users. users, yeah, yep, exactly. So you just pop in here, and then you've got you just pull the template from box A, and then it copies that out to these other boxes. You send them on their way, and they're good. Um, and we can even do this with kind of a zero touch provisioning um, system. So. The device doesn't have to be online. Well, it has to be online to receive that configuration, but it doesn't have to be online to have the configuration pushed to it. So what we can do is we can box up. Uh, I can ship out this order. I can ship it out to you, box it up, get it in the way, get it in the mail. And while it's in transit from me to you, I set up the template configuration to push this template fr from my, my uh, donor device, my master device to your target device. And then once you get your box, you take it out of the box, plug in all the cables, it connects back to ETMD automatically, pulls this template configuration and applies it instantly. So you don't have to do anything. Nice. Which is pretty handy for sure. MSPs love templates. <laughs> absolutely. I know yep. I do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely agreed. And this is, uh, again, something that we're working on, um, kind of filling out a little bit more. One of the limitations to this particular system, as I'm sure you've realized, is it does require a donor box that exists, right? So, this uh, this template doesn't live here in ETM dashboard. It effectively takes a snapshot of the donor device um, and then kind of pushes that template out. So that donor device does need to be accessible and you end up with kind of a box that sits there and is your template box, right? That doesn't necessarily have a, a ton of other use. Um, so that's a bit of a drawback and we're working on kind of centralizing that into ETMD so that you'll be able to do all of this from ETM dashboard without needing that um, that existing device, right? So you'll be able to manage all of this through uh, the ETM dashboard itself. Okay. And then there's a specific, there's a specific version of this. So if I want to just push my web filter settings, for example, I can do just that. So rather than all of the settings, I can just push whatever um, application configuration I want to use to um, to my target devices. So that is pretty much the gist of ETM dashboard. Uh, those are all the the really cool features about it. Okay. So. Um, the next thing that I kind of want to get into is I want to spend some time on NG firewall. And typically I would just go to one of these devices. Uh, that's the, that's a micro edge. Um, typically I would go to one of these devices and show you how the remote access button works. Pretend I click that. And now here we are in NG firewall. So nice. This is again, our flagship. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of knobs, a lot of buttons, a lot of settings and options. It's really robust. Um, so I will do my best to keep this to, uh, as short as possible. Um, I get somewhat excited about this product. I, I actually like it a lot. I really believe in what it, what it is and what it does. And I have a tendency to go on about it a little bit. So, um, <laughs> I will, I will try to keep, try to keep that to a minimum. But, uh, when we pop into the UI here, 
for the NG firewall, we get a dashboard, same as we got in ETM dashboard. The difference here is that this is information specifically about this appliance. So this is uh, a Z4 server. It's uh, it's actually sitting right next to me here, just a piece of hardware that I've got in my network. Okay. And we get some resource information about it, how much memory is being used, disk space consumption, the CPU load, et cetera, as well as some information about the network as a whole. Um, unfortunately, I also don't have uh, any devices passing traffic through this. So things like reports are a little bit sterile on this one. Um, but we see widgets similar to uh, the ETM dashboard, and each of these corresponds to a particular report. So if we go to, for example, sessions per minute, this widget is a five minute view. So it's from now back to, oh, it's an hour in this uh, in this case. So it's kind of just a heads up, you know, at a glance look at this report. But if I go to the report itself, we get a lot more detail. Oh, and wow. Reports is one of kind of one of the party pieces of NG Firewall. Um, it is incredibly dense. There's it's really granular um, reporting, and we cover basically everything in here. So this particular report, uh, sessions per minute, is the the total number of sessions created per minute that's passing through this NG Firewall. Not a lot um, in this case because it's just creating its own traffic. But if we go to something like this is one of my favorites. This is the kitchen sink report, network, all sessions. This tells us everything this NG firewall knows about every session that's passing through it. So by default, we get kind of a little bit of information. We get kind of where it's coming from, where it's going to, and the ports that are involved. But what we can do is open this details pane on the right-hand side. And now this gives us the rest of the information. This tells us everything else that we know. So um, we see kind of some layer three information here under the top. And that's got all your standard, you know, where it's coming from, where it's going to, IP addresses, protocols, ports that are being used, uh, the interfaces that it's connecting through. And then we get down to the application stuff. So if any application saw this traffic and scanned it, what it saw and what it did about it. So if this particular traffic had been, for example, classified as a particular ca uh, particular application under application control, we would see this value field with that application. If we okay. did something about it, um, we would see this rule entry filled in. So it would tell us uh, not only what we did, but the exact rule that was triggered that caused us to take this particular action. And it'll be gotcha. the same for all the other applications. You know, if something was blocked by the firewall, we'll see what rule blocked it. Um, if we're doing SSL inspection, if we're doing threat prevention, um, if there's a, you know, a block from threat prevention, we'll see the reputations in here. We'll go into that, um, kind of what that means a little bit. But like I said, super granular, great for troubleshooting. Um, and great for uh, admins who need to have a lot of visibility into their network and really have a good idea of what's going on and what's happening um, with traffic passing through. So we've got these uh, these eight categories in blue here at the top. These are basically reports about the device itself. So networking okay. is kind of the general network um, information. You know, things about users. If we have user, uh, if we're getting username information, um, some admin stuff, including this all settings changes report, which is the one that security focused admins want to see. Um, if a change was made to the NG firewall, this report will be updated with um, the username that was used to log in to make the change, the IP address that that username logged in from, and of course the timestamp, plus it'll give you a differential. And this one shows us, for example, that the fish blocker app was removed. So we can actually see exactly what happened when any change was made, who made the change and where they made it from. Nice. Which is super helpful, yeah. Um, so these are our system related. And then as you can see, each application has its own report section. So if we want to see just what web filter saw, we can go over here and we can take a look at something like all web events. Obviously there's not anything to show here, um, but these, you know, you can see these reports are super granular um, and there are a ton of different things that you can look for. So all web events is every piece of web traffic, right? Flagged web events is just things that were flagged just things that were blocked here. We can look at specifically HTTP and not HTTPS traffic or vice versa. Um, we even have a feature that allows users to temporarily unblock uh, a particular website. So you try to go to something, you get a block page, there's an option on that page to temporarily give you access to that page. So we've got a report that shows you that. Uh, search events, if someone went to, uh, for example, Google, Bing, whatever search engine, we can see what they searched for. Okay. And so really, really detailed, really granular reports there. Um, there are about 400 default reports that come with the NG firewall, and we can create customized ones to suit whatever need we might have. Um, I've seen a lot of instances where someone might have a particular saved, uh, a custom report that's essentially a saved search for a particular user, someone who is maybe um, historically problematic with their internet usage, and we want to be able to see not only what everyone is doing, but I want to see what that guy is doing, because I know that he's 
typically up to no good. I know that we have to keep a tighter leash on him so we can create a report that shows us exactly what that guy's doing at any given time. So tons and tons of reporting uh, options in there. And then moving on over to the config area, this is uh, NG Firewall operates, broadly speaking, in two pieces. One is going to be the stuff that lives in config, and this is all of our uh, our layer three configuration. So um, very similar to any kind of managed switches or uh, routers that anybody's used before. And then the other piece is going to be the apps, um, which we'll get to in just a bit. But uh, you know, here in uh, here in config network interfaces, these are our interfaces. These are the physical connections or the the virtual connections to uh, to this device. So we've got this guest Wi-Fi VLAN, for example, associated with maybe an access point that's downstream um, that's providing guest Wi-Fi. And some other uh, VLAN interfaces just for testing purposes, whatever, and then physical ones, the uh, the LAN and the WAN, or the downstream uh, internal network and the upstream external network. And we can also act as a DHCP server for internal networks. Uh, this is optional, so if there's an existing DHCP server in the network, we can just turn this off and then we don't confuse anybody. Um, or we can be your DHCP server. Great for small environments that don't necessarily have... Um, other, you know, kind of like other routers in place or other kind of DHCP serving, that sort of thing. Okay. So you can define the scope of the DHCP server lease and everything right there. Absolutely. Yep. And so this, uh, the range does need to be within the subnet that's associated with the interface. So this is a dot two dot one slash 24. So we've got uh, dot two dot zero through uh, dot two dot two fifty five. Obviously, uh, dot zero and 255 are reserved for system use. But I mean, we can set this as low as dot two and this one as high as 254 and that'll give us well that's too many um <laughs> and that'll give us about 250 um assignable ip addresses if we change this subnet to something like a uh slash 23 then we can take this one up to about 3.24 and that gives us about 500 addresses um so as long as you're relatively uh confident in your subnetting you can absolutely set up kind of whatever the range uh whatever range would be appropriate okay nice and then we can also alias to this interface uh, if there are other IP addresses that we want this interface to know that it owns. Um, so for example, it might also have 2.168.3.1, and uh, that will alert this interface that it knows and can respond on both of those subnets. Okay, nice. So it would respond to like a ping attempt or something. Yep, exactly. Okay, so then if gotcha. I uh, if I set this up and then I try to ping to dot three dot one or to dot two dot one, I'll I'll get responses from both, and um, okay. this interface will then be able to route traffic to anything in dot two dot x or dot three dot x in that case. So okay. an alias is very similar to a static route, um, which we can also do a different way. But yeah, I mean, kind of your basic uh, layer three configuration should be pretty familiar to um, anyone who's like I said has used managed switches or other routing products before. Sure. Um, Got your standard port forward rules. If there is traffic that exists out on the internet that you need to allow into the network, you can set those up here. So as an example, we've got this inbound traffic uh, port forward to a web server. So any inbound TCP or UDP traffic on ADN 443, we're going to send it down to this .29.250, which is a web server. Uh, NAT configuration, if you need to set up uh, NAT different from the default. So outbound traffic on a WAN is going to have uh, this option set by default and that traffic exiting this interface, which is standard behavior for any kind of um, internet facing uh, device, like an edge device like this. But if we need traffic that is exiting this interface to come from a different IP address than the actual IP address, so currently .29.124, if I need this to come from a different address, I can set up customized NAT rules here. Bypass rules are kind of a cool feature. Um, so we talked a little bit about the separation between the layer three and layer seven stuff. Um, the layer seven stuff operates in a space we call the UVM or the Untangled Virtual Machine, which is a layer seven engine that runs uh, the applications as well as the UI. And bypass rules give us the ability to bypass the whole UVM. So any traffic that is bypassed is only uh, is only handled at layer three. So it's only subject to the configuration you see right here. It never sees any of the applications. So web filter doesn't look at it. Um, you know, it won't be captured by captive portal, things like that. And there are a couple of reasons that we do this. Um, one of them is going to be for something like a guest Wi-Fi. You know, you're you're on your own. We're not going to filter or protect your devices in any way. We're going to give you basically unrestricted access to the internet. Okay. We can do that. Um, but it also, the transition from the layer three area up to that UVM and back down sometimes causes issues with certain kinds of traffic, right? And VoIP is a great example. Um, VoIP traffic <laughs> is notoriously fragile. And so that transition back and forth between the UVM and uh, the core part of the system 
can cause VoIP issues. So we bypass this VoIP traffic. We never pass it to the UVM. It's handled basically transparently. Um, and I mean, this is our, our recommendation for anyone who has uh, who's using it with VoIP services, right? Is just bypass it. Don't bother trying to pass it through individual applications and that sort of thing. And we can also um, we can also bypass anything that doesn't necessarily need to be run through content filtering, right? So this uh, this example is a network printer. So we've got that just Emmet that uh, multifunction printer in the office, and we don't want to run its traffic through application control. We don't want to potentially get it caught by the captive portal and things like that. Um, so we can bypass that device, and so it never uh, it is never subject to those limitations. Gotcha. Moving on a little bit, filter rules. These are your standard isolation uh, kind of firewally rules, right? So we've got some examples here. Uh, this first rule allows people connected to our guest Wi-Fi interface to access the internet, but nothing else. So they can't talk to any of my internal devices. Um, but they again, they have access out to the internet. And then this same rule in reverse prevents all of my internal devices, my wired office computers and IoT things and whatever I might have from talking to anything that's on that guest Wi-Fi. So just kind of security and isolation in both directions for both parties. Kind of putting that guest Wi-Fi on a DMZ, so to speak. Absolutely. Yep. That's um, so the combination of yeah that bypass rule, um, and this uh, and this this combination of rules. Yep. So the guest Wi-Fi, like I said, it can access the internet. We don't touch its traffic. We don't do anything with it. But it's not allowed to talk to anything inside of the network, and vice versa. Um, so okay. just in the off chance, you know, sometimes people aren't as careful as they should be, and we don't run any risk of you know, someone's on their iPhone and goes to a malware website and then infects my entire network sure or what have you um and then more uh some kind of more specific rules this is very similar um this rule is going to block this particular device dot 29.144 from anything in anything that's not a wan anything that's internal right so this okay. server can communicate with the internet but not with any of its other uh, any of the other devices that it has so maybe this is a web server maybe this is like you said it's a dmz um so that we just don't want it to be able to communicate with anything internally just in case okay and then we can create some really specific rules like um, we will get uh, we'll get users who will say, hey, I'm, I'm uh, distributing my workforce. I'm letting them work from home. But when they're connected via the VPN, I don't want them to be able to access anything except their own computer. So we can create a rule like that. So we can say traffic coming from OpenVPN that has this particular IP address is only allowed to access this one particular device. So this might be maybe a file server that... Uh, everyone needs to have access to maybe it's the user's own desktop computer in the office so that they can effectively RDP to that computer, but they can't get to anything else. So we don't run the risk of anybody, you know, connecting to things that they shouldn't be able to. Okay. And then uh, options for DHCP serving. So this is um, when we are set up as a DHCP server. Unfortunately, I don't have any leases here to show you, um, but any leases provided by the NG firewall will appear here on the right hand side. And then we have static DHCP entries, which are your reservations. If a particular device should always get the same IP address, we can configure it here rather than statically assigning it on the device itself. And there's even a handy add static button here. So if I wanna just create a static uh, DHCP entry for a particular device that's already leased, just click that button once, it'll move it right over. And we have, um, and we have a reservation set up. Awesome. And then some troubleshooting tools. I'm sorry, were you gonna ask a question there? No, I was just going to tell you that I, I find that very helpful if you've got something and you want to make sure it always keeps that same IP address. Sometimes you just can't get and static the NIC locally. So that's very nice that you can add the static there, uh, set a static entry for the DHCP Absolutely. release. Yeah. It's super useful for policies. It's super useful for application settings and things. Um, okay. And even just, even just keeping track of stuff, you know, I see your device connect to... The network, uh, you know, you bring your laptop into the office, you connect it to the Wi-Fi, whatever it might be, and now I can go, okay, well, whenever I see Scott's laptop, that always gets this IP address dot one two three, right? Yep. And now I know dot one two three refers to specifically your laptop, so that gives me the ability to then uh, create policies that affect you specifically based on you know that IP address. But again, we go back to reports. I can create a report that just uh, that filters down, that windows down to just your specific IP address, so I can see what that laptop is doing at any given time. So yeah, those DHC, DHCP reservations super handy um, in a, really a lot of environments, and I've even used, um, I've even used this in my own my own home network a few times just to be like, look, I can't be I can't be bothered to go in and statically assign, I you know IP addresses to the TV and the you know and all of these IoT things and whatever else. Just pick them out of the list, assign the static thing, and that way they have the same address, and I don't have to um, configure anything on the device. Yep. You know, like, 
if you've ever tried to set it up, you know, static, uh, static IP addressing on something like a smart TV, it's not as simple <laughs> as it would be on a Windows laptop. That, that was where that was my point. Uh, a lot of times it's easy. It, this is a very easy method to accomplish the same thing. Yep, 100 percent. Absolutely. Um, and again, in environments that are, you know, you see in a lot of t- in a lot of cases, like an enterprise environment does a lot of very kind of high level static assignments and things like that. But, you know, for somebody who's maybe running a small business or who has just a, a small office, things like that, sure. it's so much easier than having to touch every device in the <laughs> network and so on and so forth. So, yep. And then we've got some troubleshooting tools. These do what they say on the tin. Connectivity test, make sure that the NG firewall has a connection to the internet. We can do pings, DNS lookups. Um, the one I like to point out is this download test, which is a speed test. Okay, nice. So this result here in parentheses, if it would highlight, there we go. That's the bandwidth that the NG firewall received at this, at this interface um, with no consideration for any rules or configuration. So this is raw bandwidth we're getting. It's not affected by any application settings or anything like that. Um, so we know for sure that this NG firewall got 13.7 megabytes uh, per second from the next device up the, up the chain, which in this case is a router. What's the max um, throughput on those? Um, it's going to depend on the hardware, really. Um, all of our appliances include uh, gigabit internet, uh, Ethernet ports. So okay. in theory, um, in theory, very close to a gigabit. Um, some of the smaller devices, uh, something like the Z4, um, that runs on a J1900 Celeron processor. So it's not super beefy. Um, I would say that throughput for a Z4 appliance probably caps out at about half a gig, so about 500 megabits a second. Um, okay. And then going all the way up to the enterprise devices, um, the Z20 or the Q20 appliance has uh, 10 gig SPF plus ports, and we expect throughput to be roughly similar to that. Um, obviously, that'll be limited by kind of how much you're doing with the appliance and how much processing goes on and everything. Um, but it should be pretty, um, it, like I said, it's hardware dependent is, is the biggest kind of bottleneck. The stateful inspections, the packet inspecting, that 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 actually can cut down on the bandwidth too, right? It absolutely can. That'll generate a lot of overhead. Um, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but it it will generate overhead, right? So anytime we have to tear a packet apart and look at all the things inside it and then rebuild that packet, re-encrypt it, um, that's definitely sure. going to add some kind of resource um, expenditure to the process. It's going to be a little bit more expensive from a resource perspective. And that can cause a tiny bit of additional... Um, uh, additional bandwidth usage, additional yeah, uh, latency. performance hit. Yeah. Yep, exactly. That's the phrase I was looking for. Thank you. Um, and the one thing that I do like to point about point out about this is that we see M capital M capital B. This figure is in megabytes. So this is the only place in the NG firewall where this comes up. But if we want to get the value that you get from example your ISP, we got to multiply this value by eight, right? So 14, 14 times eight is about one hundred and twenty, I think. Um, so this is about one hundred and twenty megabits per second. Okay. I was scratching my head when I first saw that. I was like, ah, oh, that's that's a low, low incoming connection. It does. It's it 13 seems very megs, low. but no, no. So okay, that's more respectable. Yep. And that that definitely comes up. Um, you know, we've had people be like, you know, my ISP says I'm getting a hundred, but this test says twelve point five. What, you know, like <laughs> how is it that and it's yeah, it's so that's kind of the one, uh, the one sort of gotcha there. Um, but then also a packet test, you know, if you if you're familiar with like a wireshark, um, PCAP type of test that allows you to run it from the NG firewall itself. It gives us nice. some kind of troubleshooting okay. um, capacity right here in the device. And then um, we'll head on over to the apps. So this is kind of the this is kind of the bulk of what NG firewall does. And all of these applications are modular. So there's an install apps button. If we pop into that screen, we'll see there's some apps mm. that actually aren't installed here. Um, Typically, because there's a better there's a better version. Um, you know, there's a virus blocker light as compared with our full version of virus blocker um, uses a different database and it's not quite as uh, as effective. So, you know, we tell people to use the full version whenever possible. Um, and we also have a spam blocker and fish blocker apps, which are um, a little bit limited. Uh, they cannot scan webmail, so they are of a fairly limited utility nowadays. Uh, if you have an on-premise email server, then you can absolutely use spam blocker, but they're just scanning uh, SMTP port twenty five email. So gotcha. sad stuff out of the way. Um, the applications that remain here, like I said, you can remove anything that you're not using. Um, usually I'll tell people if you turn something off for longer than to troubleshoot it, just uninstall it. Um, saves a little bit on performance. You know, it, it helps uh, declutter the UI a little bit. So there's fewer things that you kind of have to look at. But each okay. application pretty much does what it sounds like it does. So starting with web filter, filters the web. 
This is our HTTP and HTTPS content filtering um, feature. And one of its kind of party pieces is this category feature. So we have partnered with uh, WebRoot's Bright Cloud service. Okay. And one of their uh, one of the things that Bright Cloud does is it categorizes the web into one of 80, uh, one of 80 categories. So we see streaming media, peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Um, there's, you know, home and garden. There's a ton of these different um, categories. And uh, the number changes every time, uh, every time I see it, but they claim something on the order of 32 billion with a B URLs have been categorized. Wow. So yeah, quite a lot, quite a lot. And so this allows us to, um, you know, if I don't want anyone to get access to hunting and fishing websites at all, this is going to block everything that would come back in that category Okay. with just that single click. Um, one of the kind of security features that we build in is that this security category, we're going to block all of this stuff by default. So when you install WebFilter, these seven categories are automatically enabled. So right out of the box, we're blocking phishing sites, malware sites, keyloggers, et cetera, things and stuff, uh, that sort of thing. And we also block the adult and pornography category by default. Um, I imagine that most workplaces typically will not want to allow adult content. So sure. um, that's one of those sort of executive decisions. But of course, if you do need to allow it, you can just pop right in there and turn that off. Um, which brings us to our block sites and our past sites. Um, block sites are specific websites that we want never to be accessible. So for example, we're blocking Facebook here. Um, and then a past site is the opposite of that. So a past site is a site that is always allowed regardless of what its category setting might be. Arista.com. Uh, yeah, Arista.com. <laughs> um, so we always want the corporate website to be accessible no matter what else we might be blocking. Okay. Um, and we do have this site lookup feature. So we look up the old website, untangle.com. We can see this belongs to these two categories, computer and internet security and business and economy. And if we uh, if we block either of these, then the website will be blocked because it belongs to a blocked category. Um, there is an option here to suggest a different category. Things do get miscategorized sometimes. And um, the nice thing about this is there is this option here where you can just select a different category that uh, we want to put it in and then click the suggest button. This uh, sends that request immediately to the WebRoot team and a human being, like a real actual person, reviews it, checks it out to make sure that it is that it aligns with uh, that the suggestion aligns with what the, the website actually is. And typically those changes get made sometimes within hours. Um, so it's really pretty quick. They're pretty responsive. And there's actually also a tool on their website that you can use to do, to do the same thing. Very nice. Um, and uh, some of the other kind of fun features here, um, we have the ability to look at SNI, server name indication information, which allows us to block HTTPS encrypted traffic without decrypting it. So um, we have another, another ancillary application called SSL Inspector, which does our <laughs> HTTPS decryption. Um, SSL Inspector is powerful, but it, as, as with anything that's very powerful, there is some kind of uh, extra stuff that you have to do to get it running, um, and it tends to cause some issues. So we don't need to use SSL inspection in order to be functional. So obviously, Facebook has been uh, using HTTPS pretty much the whole time. Um, if we were not decrypting that packet header, we would not see the URL for Facebook. We just see the communication between the two IPs, which would mean that something like this rule would never work because we wouldn't actually get access to see that URL. With this SNI information turned on, like I said, we don't have to do packet decryption. Um, and it renders both web filter a little bit more performance, um, but it also makes it a lot easier to uh, to block traffic. We have a lot of users who um, never deploy SSL inspector at all and have uh, web filter works absolutely fine. Um, it works honestly really well. So I always like to highlight that. And then some safe browsing options. Um, we can enforce safe search options on uh, Google, Bing, Yahoo Search, and some other search engines so that whenever a user, regardless of what their browser settings might be, when they send uh, a search term to Google, we will force that connection to use the safe search option so that Google only returns the uh, you know vetted safe search results, as well as forcing uh, the same thing, um, enforcing restricted mode on YouTube, which is basically the same idea. Or we have the option to uh, redirect all searches through major search engines to a kid-friendly search engine called Kids Search, um, which is basically Google search in safe mode by default. Okay. Um, as well as some kind of extra options here, um, we have the ability to restrict Google applications. So, for example, if you want to, uh, if you want your users to be able to access Google Drive but not Google Chat, we can set up restrictions for that um, so that they can only get to certain uh, Google applications. 
The note, of course, is uh, is important. We need to be using SSL Inspector and inspecting Google traffic to do so, <laughs> but it is an option. We also have the ability to use a custom block page. Um, the default block page is pretty straightforward. It just says you're not allowed to access this page. Uh, contact your network administrator if you have questions, things like that. Or if you would like, you can uh, create your own custom block page to do and say anything that you would like. And this gives us the ability to, instead of serving our own block page, we will redirect uh, blocked traffic to that custom page that you have hosted elsewhere in your network. So you, nice. like I said, you can do pretty much whatever you want with that, um, with that block page. And then these unblock options, uh, we mentioned this a little bit um, earlier on. This allows a user the option to temporarily uh, unblock, at, unblock uh, a particular block site. So if you have a very sort of draconian policy where you're blocking everything and then whitelisting things that are allowed, this can be useful um, so that you as the admin don't have to be looking at every single thing. The user can kind of temporarily allow themselves access to a particular site. And uh, it's got that built-in timer, so 10 minutes by default. And we can set a password option. So it can either be the admin password that you would use to log into the NG firewall or a custom password that you specify here. Nice. And then they just need to enter that password in order to get that unblock. Uh, and the other option is going to be permanent and global, which will uh, effectively add a pass site entry to the NG firewall for that particular website. So again, that's one that I usually recommend uh, that we use a password with. Obviously that ability <laughs> is, is ripe for misuse uh, in certain environments. So bouncing out here, um, cover some other stuff real quickly. Virus Blocker uses the Bits Defender um, set of signatures and definition list. Um, okay. So it's it's pretty well regarded. Um, it is pretty effective. The kind of gotcha with Virus Blocker is that most of the web at this point is encrypted, and Virus Blocker cannot decrypt that traffic on its own. So it does need to be used with SSL Inspector to be as effective as possible. Um, for that reason, and also based on the fact that we don't specialize in this kind of thing, I tell people, this is an extra line of defense. This is not your antivirus solution. Um, sure. Please do not use virus blocker uh, at the gateway and assume that it is going to be like as full featured as something like, you know, a desktop, even the uh, Microsoft Defender, Windows Defender, whatever it's called. Even that is actually really effective. Um, but obviously those are specialized to that particular thing and they live on your device so they can kind of search your device itself. Uh, my NG firewall can't do a virus scan on your computer's uh, hard drive, right? So we sure. can only interact with traffic at, kind of as it passes through us. So virus blocker is great as like an extra measure of security. But again, I tell people, please don't rely on it. Um, sure. It's another layer. It is. Absolutely. And that's one of the things we like to point out a little bit, particularly with NG Firewall, is that this is really kind of like a layered system um, of security and of filtering. Um, when traffic is passed up to uh, the UVM, the first thing that it hits is policy manager, which determines kind of which set of applications it's going to be processed by. And then once it exits policy manager, we throw it into the pile and all of the applications kind of have a go at it, right? So they function basically simultaneously because they're all looking for different things. So web filter is looking at web traffic. Um, SSL inspector is decrypting uh, SSL traffic. App control is looking at uh, traits, characteristics of, um, of the traffic and so on and so forth. So because each app is looking at a different thing and does a different thing, they each kind of get a go at it. And that kind of layered sort of security um, paradigm, it means that if it's blocked by something, it remains blocked when it comes out of the UVM. So if it's blocked by anything in the UVM, then it's then the traffic is blocked. I've got so, a dumb question. Looking at sure. this, it, you know, the little green dots in the top, they look like power buttons to me. Mm -hmm. So that would signify that that module is on. Correct. So why is the firewall module off on this device? Isn't that, that like the is, holy grail, the most important part? Oh, man, I'm so glad that you asked that question. Um, okay. Because this is a this is a consistent uh, a consistent thing. The firewall application should probably be called something else. Um, okay. It is implied based on the name, that it is necessary to the firewall security functioning of this device. Not at all correct. Um, okay. In fact, if I even bounce out to one of these other ones, uh, let me just connect up to the Z20 while I'm talking about this. Um, and come on. Okay. Well, uh, the firewall app only does what you tell it to do. Okay. And the default app, uh, the default rules that we're going to show you in the firewall app don't do anything. They don't trigger. Um, they're, they use kind of dummy IP addresses. 1.2.3.4 is one of them. Um, yeah, let me pop in and kind of show you this one here. It's a little bit sluggish on initial connection. I'm, unlike uh, unlike the, the other one that I've been demoing here, uh, this one is actually halfway across the country. 
So I've shot myself in the foot because I've already configured this one to do, uh, to be correct. Anyway, the point being, um, the firewall application might be better, might be better called something like outbound traffic access. I, I work in marketing. You'd think I could be better at coming up with names for things. <laughs> um, but no yeah, so the, the firewall application, like I said, is not necessary to the firewall security of the device. Um, it's still a NAT device. It still is protecting your, you don't have to install this at all. Um, but what this application does is this gives you the ability to create uh, rules very similar to the filter rules that we talked about back under the layer three area, but we have more criteria. So rather than just using the numbers, um, you know, things like IP addresses, ports, and protocols that you would see anytime now, um, we can use other config, other conditions, um, threat prevention, reputation lookups, uh, membership in active directory groups. Please respond. I'm in the middle of the demo. <laughs> okay. Well, I probably shouldn't have closed this other appliance. Uh, we will see what happens there. So um, while I'm waiting for this to, to respond and come back up, uh, oh boy, this is getting even worse. Terrible timing, not great. You know, in fact, I had, uh, I had internet issues just before getting connected to this thing. And I was like, this is not the time for this. Well, we've made it through the whole demo without any glitches. So far, so, so good. Yeah, so far. Absolutely. I think that that might be, that might be becoming a problem, but, um, so here we are back in the firewall application and this is on our Z20 demo unit. Um, so, Kind of two of the cool things that you can do with this are going to be this GOIP blocking. So we can block all traffic from particular countries or traffic to particular countries um, or vice versa. I've seen people use a rule that is effectively uh, disallow all traffic, not from the United States, for example, um, or okay. whatever your, your home country might be. So that gives us kind of an extra, very broad <laughs> layer of blocking that you don't necessarily have to already know is a problem, right? So with web filter, you have to know what website you want to block in order for it to block something. Sure. With this, uh, with this firewall GOIP blocking, I can just tell it, I don't want any traffic from Russia, full stop. And I don't need to know anything else about it. Um, and so we just go with that and block that traffic. Or as I said, we can use uh, Active Directory group membership. So if I have someone who is in the Active Directory group, no internet, they get no internet. So, um, that is, those are, those are kind of the use cases really for the firewall uh, application. Typically, if you have the ability to create something in both the firewall application and in filter rules, you usually want to do it in filter rules. Um, they take place earlier in the network stack and they tend to be a little bit more, um, it, that lends a little bit of performance kind of back to the ng firewall that we would lose um, if we were to pass it up to application processing. Okay. So because this is a different unit, you can see we've got spam blocker and fish blocker there. Um, I'll cover these very quickly. Not a lot of options here. Um, essentially, whenever uh, a piece of email comes in, it is scanned and certain traits of that email are assigned point values. So if the email is all in caps, or if it begins with the phrase, dear beloved, or if it's from Nigeria, um, various and sundry attributes, each of these is assigned a point value. And then that point value is totaled up. And if it is higher than your strength setting here, we consider the email as spam, and then we'll take action based on what that is. So obviously we can set it very low or very high. And then we've got this super spam threshold. So if anything came in with a point value up above 20, we're just going to drop it at the gateway. It never comes into the network at all. Um, and then based on uh, the action type that we have here, uh, we can mark an email, which means that we pass it through to wherever it's going, but we append the word spam to the beginning of the subject line. Okay. We can pass it, which means we don't do anything, um, in which case you would still have reports entries generated for it, but the email itself is not altered in any way. We can drop it, which does exactly what it sounds like, or we can quarantine it. So we can put it into kind of a sandbox where uh, that email is not, um, no scripts will run, no, um, it doesn't include any uh, inline attachments, things like graphics, that sort of thing. Um, and the user for whom the email was destined will receive an email from the Angie firewall that says, hey, you have a quarantined email, please click this link to go to manage your quarantine. Uh, and then they can go and either, they can review the email and either release it, uh, in which case it is marked as not spam and pass through to them, or they can drop it there. And then we make kind of make a note um, about that particular email that this is definitely spam and we should ignore um, future, you know, future emails uh, that fit these characteristics. Okay. And then uh, fish blocker is essentially an add-on to spam blocker. It runs on the same engine um, and it has very few options as you can see. Um, this is just the difference between spam blocker and fish blocker is that fish blocker is specifically looking for phishing stuff. So it's specifically looking for phishing strategies and uh, attempts to glean information from people 
um, via various phishing tactics, whereas spam spam blocker will catch you know marketing emails and things like that. Okay. So again, the limitation with those two is that they're scanning SMTP port 25 only. Um, so that limits them in this day and age. Um, obviously, more and more people are using web-based emails, and uh, we don't have the ability to scan that kind of traffic. So next one is bandwidth control, which is prioritizing and deprioritizing traffic, QoS or traffic shaping. Um, this is a really powerful application in that one of the things that you see here under these conditions is you see some other applications noted. So when each application acts on, um, when each application scans a particular piece of, of traffic, it makes everything that it knows available to the other applications. And some applications have the ability to act on that information. Um, so, you know, for example, we see here, this web filter website is flagged rule. So if web filter flagged a particular website, bandwidth control can see that flag status and then can execute deprioritization based on that status. Or we can do it with application control. If application control identifies some traffic as BitTorrent, we can add a tag to that host so that we know that they're doing something they probably shouldn't be. Okay. You can also just use straight up websites. Um, any admin knows Patch Tuesday comes around and your network stops working for a couple hours while a hundred computers in your <laughs> network all try to update at once. We can deprioritize Windows updates or any particular website. I mean, there's another one here for uh, for Dropbox, you know, uh, limiting uh, uploads and downloads from those websites. We can prioritize traffic. So, for example, SSH, we can set to very high or high. Prioritize that RDP traffic to very high. So whatever uh, whatever traffic is important, we can give it very high priority. And whatever traffic is less important or is actually detrimental to the network, we can deprioritize that. So uh, yeah, bandwidth control, pretty powerful, pretty straightforward. Is this back up yet? No, it's dead, alas. Um, moving on very briefly, uh, SSL inspector, we discussed this allows us to decrypt, to fully decrypt <laughs> HTTPS traffic. And there are two, um, two important gotchas about SSL inspector. One of them is this root certificate authority. Um, the short version of what this does is SSL inspector acts as a man in the middle attack. So you try to go to google.com, the NG firewall stops your browser session, masquerades as your browser, connects to google.com and says, hey, give me the www page. Google responds, returns that page, then the NG firewall has it. So then we uh, strip the encryption, pull that packet apart, pull out everything that we need from it. We then need to re-encrypt that traffic before we send it back down to your device. Problem is we're not google.com, so we cannot apply the security, uh, the security certificate, google.com, to that traffic. So we need to download a root certificate authority to install on your computer that tells your computer that it can trust uh, certificates signed by untangle.com or whatever the device might be, right? Gotcha. So this requires us to do a little bit of configuration outside of the NG firewall in that you have to uh, install this root certificate on every device that will be subject to SSL inspection which can cause some problems with mobile operating systems. Uh, both Android and iOS are finicky about the way um, they will trust certificates and the way that we install certificates and everything. Um, for a very long time, the standard line was do not use SSL inspector with Android devices because it just won't work. Um, things have changed you know, a little bit, but obviously there's some kind of extra configuration that has to be done here. And of course, the other thing with SSL inspector is exactly as you mentioned, that kind of packet inspection is resource heavy. So. We, we give you a rule for inspect all traffic and we turn it off by default. Um, this is a pretty substantial resource hog. It's not gonna cripple a network um, in most cases, unless it's already kind of at the edge of uh, the device's performance capability. Um, but you, you will notice this in a lot of cases, uh, especially in smaller networks. So typically the process for SSL inspector is gonna be inspect the stuff that you know you have to and leave everything else alone. Um, so SSL Inspector is, it It gives a little bit more visibility um, to some of the applications. As I said, with Virus Blocker, it can make it a lot more effective because it gives the ability to scan other things that it wouldn't be able to. Um, with Web Filter, uh, everything after the .com slash part of a URL is referred to as the URI, and that URI information is contained inside the packet, so we can't see that without using SSL Inspector. And so the reason that you might do something like that is if you wanted to block access to particular parts of a website. So um, if you wanted to allow someone to go to facebook.com, but not facebook.com slash videos or whatever it might be. Obviously that's a terrible example, but you know, anything that's gonna be delineated by those kind of subsites, um, using SSL inspector with web filter would give us the ability to see those things after the .com slash part and then enact um, blocking rules based on that. 
Okay. So pretty specific use cases. Um, in, in most cases, I tell people SSL inspector doesn't really add a ton um, of functionality or, or value, honestly. Um, if you have something like a school and you, you have uh, SIPA requirements that will uh, that you're forced to decrypt at uh, HTTPS traffic, we'll absolutely do our best to kind of get you, you know, up and running and get it working, but um, it's, it can be tough and it can cause some problems. Sure. Sliding right along, application control allows us to identify and classify traffic as belonging to a particular application. And when we say application, we mean a lot of things. So we get this definition, we get this list of definitions. There are a little over 2000 of them as of right now. Um, and these are going to include things like YouTube. So if I click this block box, any traffic that is associated with youtube.com or a YouTube desktop app or a YouTube mobile app on your phone, um, or even any embedded service that pulls from YouTube on some other website will be blocked. So we can identify that traffic as being, you know, YouTube traffic. We can, we can identify, for example, the TikTok mobile application, and we can just say, you know, this is a school, kids don't need it. Turn that off. This has some other, um, some other kind of interesting um, sort of correlations in that uh, application control is a little different from WebFilter. Uh, WebFilter looks at port 80 and 443, HTTP and HTTPS traffic only. Application control looks at everything. It looks at the servers that it's going to, the ports that it's used, that it uses. Um, you know, some, some programs and applications have pretty well-known ports that they use, so we can use that to identify the traffic. It also contains its own built-in deep packet inspection. So it's going to decrypt the whole packet, take a look at the inside of it, and see kind of what's going on with it. Um, so it is really super accurate and um, and pretty pretty convenient uh, for, you know, for kind of, excuse me, for security purposes and for kind of content filtering purposes. And like I said, there's a ton of these um, pre-built applications. I mean, there's one for Amazon. If you want to block access to the Amazon website, as well as um, really any other services that go through Amazon. So that is a pretty useful one. Uh, the one the one caveat that we like to point out here is that um, there's a signature for TCP traffic, for example. So it is possible to use application control overzealously and to break your network. Um, but in the cases of something like, you know, there's a, a signature, for example, for 4chan traffic. If you're familiar with 4chan, it's really not a place that you want people to be able to access in most cases. Um, and so we can just kind of block access to that. And the, the additional kind of benefit to using app control with WebFilter is that, like I said, WebFilter is looking specifically for um, 80 and 443 HTTP and HTTPS traffic, whereas sometimes other services will use different methods of communicating. And this kind of covers those other things. Um, we have a signature, for example, for UltraSurf, which um, is a proxy application that was developed by the CIA to get around the Great Firewall of China. So this is designed oh, wow. to anonymize traffic um, at like the highest possible level. So UltraSurf as an, as an application, it will use every possible trick that it can at its disposal to get your connection to work. And the reason I bring this up is the difference, of course, between a block and a tarpit. Block notifies the originating device that the connection has been closed. So um, you try to connect out, we block that traffic, and we tell you, hey, I'm closing this connection. And so the device knows that that connection has been actively closed and interrupted. So for something smart like UltraSurf, something that tries to evade these kinds of protocols, it'll just try again some other way. It'll use a different port, it'll change protocols, it tries to tunnel sometimes through things because it knows the connection was actively closed. So that gives it the kind of awareness that it can just try again some other way. A tar pit closes a connection silently. So we just close the connection and we don't inform the originating device in any way. So to the originating device, that maybe looks like a timeout. Maybe the service isn't available. You know, maybe uh, it's just not responding for some reason, but the traffic wasn't actively rejected. Ergo, we probably don't need to try again. So in the case of these kinds of like anonymizing things that are designed to evade firewalls, um, like I said, it typically orders a magnitude greater than us. Um, we can use that tar pit option and um, prevent them from kind of trying again and trying to get around us in any way that they possibly can. Nice. Next one will be Captive Portal. If you've ever used public Wi-Fi, you know exactly what this is. You try to connect to the internet and we pop a page that says you have to agree to our terms and conditions. Or we have one that is a logon page where you have to enter a username and password, sign into something, right, in order to use the internet. And we can customize this pretty broadly. Um, obviously, this one is sort of mocked up like a school district. 
but you can enter you know whatever text you like to uh you like to have here and there's also this uh, root certificate detection. So this goes back to the SSL inspector we talked about. We have the ability to detect the presence of that certificate as part of that captive page. So disable does what it says. We don't do the check at all. Check will, uh, if you do not have the certificate, there's a big red piece of text on the page that says, hey, you don't have the certificate. Here's a button you can click to install it. And then of course, require certificate. Um, you don't have the certificate. Click this button to do it or uh, you know, your, your internet connection is blocked effectively. So those are that's kind of one of the sort of convenient ways that you can get that uh, certificate onto these devices without necessarily having to physically touch them, you know, without not having to connect directly to them. Um, and we also have an option for a custom captive portal page, which is a little bit squeaky because you can do whatever you want with this. But um, one of one of the caveats with it is that our support team can't help you at all with these captive pages because they don't have the, the necessarily expertise and so on and so forth. Um, but you can create a captive page that looks like whatever you want, does whatever you want. It can feed information to APIs that you have. It can uh, do all kinds of redirects and whatever else. Anything that you can do with scripting, you can do with a captive portal page. Nice. At, at your own discretion. Uh, we talked about the firewall application very briefly. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, and then threat prevention. Um, when we discussed WebFilter, we talked about the WebRoot Bright Cloud uh, service. This is kind of another thing that the WebRoot Bright Cloud service does, which is, if I can type correctly, on tangle.com. Well, that's inconvenient. Um, there we go. This is gonna do a reputation lookup uh, anytime we try to connect to some kind of external uh, site or service. So we'll get the IP address that's associated with whatever that domain name is. And then we'll get the reputation, uh, both as a server, meaning we are connecting to that device, and as a client, meaning we're accepting connections from that device. And then based on the uh, the risk level that's associated with the trustworthiness level, we can block a whole swath of traffic. So this is our default, uh, our default setting between suspicious and high risk. Anything to the right of the slider is blocked. So any connection uh, that we determine to be high risk, we're going to block automatically. Anything that comes back lower than high risk, we're going to let it through. And obviously we can adjust this to be more... Um, more or less secure to pay based on our needs, but this is a little bit more, um, again, it's similar to sort of uh, the, the GOIP blocking in firewall, right? This allows us to block whole kinds of things without knowing anything about them. Um, it's a little bit more heuristic. It's a little bit more sort of intelligent in that we can just say, I don't want any suspicious traffic at all. And um, the bright cloud tool is really well respected. Sometimes people ask like, who is, who's generating these reputations, you know? Um, it really well respected. They've been they've been around for a long time. They've been operating this for a long time, um, and we have found very very few of what I might call false positives, where something is maybe uh, rated higher uh, or has a higher reputation than it necessarily should be. Um, but it's extremely uncommon. And so we also have the ability to create past sites, so websites that we never want to subject to the lookup, as well as rules, which can be a little bit more granular, like never uh, never do threat prevention lookups for this particular computer or this particular device, whatever it might be. Um, interesting fact here, you can actually slide this all the way to the end, in which case it does nothing. Um, it will still generate reports data, but we're not actually going to block any traffic, or you can take it all the way down, which breaks your network. Um, this will block all traffic, regardless of what it's... Um, what it's uh, what the setting, uh, what the reputation that we get from it is. Okay. So, yeah, threat prevention, great security uh, protocol. Obviously, like malware things, key loggers, command and control centers, um, spyware stuff. Obviously, all of those things are going to come back as high risk. So you can just kind of block the whole kit and caboodle, as it were. And the uh, the nice thing about this is that again, it's less specific in what it's looking at than web filter. So there are categories okay. in web filter that are going to block malware. So we've got a malware sites thing here, right? But again, we're looking at websites for that. Threat prevention is just looking at a connection to something. So it's a little bit more broad spectrum and that combined with that kind of reputation lookup and the fact that you can uh, largely just sort of set it and forget it gives you that kind of extra extra security, extra sort of peace of mind without a ton of extra with, uh, without a ton of extra configuration. And again, without necessarily you having to know what you're looking for. 
Um, so those are most of our kind of content filtering applications. The rest are pretty quick and I'll just go over them very briefly. Reports govern settings for the reports itself. And the most important setting is going to be this data retention setting. This is how long we keep data reports data on the NG firewall itself. Default's going to be seven days, goes as low as zero days in one hour, in which case I tell people just turn off reports, um, or as high as 366 days. So a full year plus a leap day. And the caveat to the extended period of retention is it uses hard drive space. So one has to be careful that one does not um, set the data retention too high and cause the hard drive to fill up, um, which causes reports to disable itself. I have seen uh, I have seen it deployed with the 366 day retention period one time. It was on a custom installation that had a two terabyte hard drive, so 2000 gigabytes, and it was about 65 or 70% full most of the time. Mm. So um, depending on the size of your network and how much, uh, how many applications you have processing traffic and everything, you'll have more and more and more um, report in, reports information and thus more disk space consumed. And then we also have the ability to connect to a Google Drive backup account. So each day we can send uh, daily reports to a Google Drive account so that you'll have kind of, an, it gives you a little bit of a buffer in terms of what reporting you have available. And it gives you kind of offsite, um, offsite storage as it were. Policy manager, we could spend so much time talking about policy manager and I wish that this was a better appliance for this. Um, policy manager allows us to create groups of users effectively. And each set of users can have their own uh, their own policies or their own set of applications. So I'm just going to add, I'm trying to add, there we go. And we're going to set this as a parent of the default. So we've got this default policy. Um, any traffic that we do not expressly move out of the default policy stays in the default. And here we can see these are the applications which are installed in the default policy. And then in the child policy, we can see that it has no applications installed. So if we go back out, so let me just save this so it commits. If we actually go back out to the apps page, we see the default policy here. If I change this to the child policy. Nice. There is nothing in it. Well, it'll take, there we go. There's nothing in it. Yeah. So this allows us to create exceptions to our usual network policy. Um, you know, the example that we like to give is uh, you block social networking in your, in your environment, but you've got a marketing group and they need to be able to get to Facebook. So you can create a default policy for everyone that blocks uh, Facebook through web filter. And then you create a, a marketing policy that's a child of that. And you install web filter to that child policy. Now we see over here in the inherited from column, this shows us where these settings are coming from. So everyone in this child policy, they get their virus blocker settings, their spam blocker settings, et cetera, from the default policy. But we see that web filter has no inheritance. So the web filter uh, that this child policy is referring to is its own installation. So again, going back over there, take just a second to load here. We now have our own individually configurable web filter. And so this does not import any settings uh, from the other one. We do have to kind of configure it again. Um, but in terms of, like I said, a, you know, a marketing group, and we saw in the other one, we had blocks for Facebook. This one doesn't. So we're not blocking Facebook for anyone who is in this child policy. And uh, we can do this with any and all of the applications just to kind of simplify configuration. Um, like I said, if there's an exception in a particular application for, um, for a, a user or a group of users, um, we, can, we can create those exceptions here. And the other thing that Policy Manager does is it has settings for time of day and day of week. So you can have policies that apply automatically at certain times and on certain days. So again, a school is a great example. Um, we have a policy that is very restrictive for the students during the day from 7 a.m. till 4 p.m. And then uh, we have another policy that's less restrictive for after school hours. And those policies take effect automatically on their own. So we put, uh, we put traffic into that basic student policy during those 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. hours. After that, that policy no longer applies. We move them into a different policy. We can do uh, things like you can uh, like lunch breaks, for example, uh, if my if I'm running this in an office and I want everyone to have pretty restricted internet during the day because they need to focus on their work, but they get their lunch hour off, I can have their work policy apply from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And then again, from 12 a.m. to 5 p.m. And that way during the workday, they're subject to that normal policy. But when that policy drops off, they get a less restricted policy automatically, again, without me having to go in and like turn a knob essentially. Okay. And we do see this in uh, some of our home environments with people who want to encourage their children to go to bed on time. 
So you can put your kids into a policy that applies automatically at 9 p.m. that blocks all internet access. So um, yeah, PM, really powerful thing. A um, lot, of, lot of cool stuff that we can do with that. Directory Connector allows us to connect to an Active Directory environment uh, or a radius server for authentication. We can also connect to an Azure hosted ADDS uh, account. And this allows us to get username information uh, in association with a particular IP address. So someone signs into, uh, someone gets to work, turns on their computer, logs into their account. That creates an event in the Active Directory log saying that uh, username John Smith is associated with IP address 1.2.3.4. We can then have that information sent to the NG firewall automatically. So as soon as John Smith logs in, we know John, the username John Smith is logged in on 1.2.3.4. And that gives us the ability to create policies based on his username um, or based on his group membership. So we can create whole policies for people who are in particular Active Directory um, groups. So pretty useful for uh, more, more corporate environments, um, typically larger, larger places that will use Active Directory. Moving on, WAN failover. Um, this will initiate a test to an external resource. The default is going to be a ping to Google DNS, which has the closest thing it's possible to have to 100% uptime. Um, and it always responds to pings. So this default test, what we're going to do is we're going to send a ping every five seconds to Google DNS. If that, Google's, if that ping comes back within an appropriate amount of time, then we will mark it down as a success and we move on. If that ping does not come back within the appropriate amount of time, we mark it down as a failure and we keep moving on until we hit the threshold. So the default is going to be three pings out of 10 or three tests out of 10, I should say. Um, if we fail three pings to Google DNS out of any 10, we're going to assume that WAN is not there, is not actually functional. You don't actually have internet access through it. And we will automatically disable that WAN. And then uh, when, so that no traffic uses it, we're not um, you know, routing anything through it. We will continue to run the tests. And then when any, uh, when any seven tests out of 10 succeed, then we consider that the WAN is back up. So this allows us in multi-WAN environments, typically places with more than one internet connection, um, to kind of automatically disable internet connections that might not be working for whatever reason, so that we're not uh, running into you know, failures to connect to things and interrupting traffic and so on and so forth. But it actually can also be useful in a single, a single WAN environment because it generates reports data. So we can, um, we can look at these reports for WAN failover and look at all these failures and everything and then take it to our ISP and go, you know, we couldn't ping Google DNS for four hours yesterday, but you're telling me the internet was up. Obviously it wasn't. So gives us a little bit of information that we can take to, um, to ISPs in those cases. And WAN failover works alongside WAN balancer um, in an environment where we have multiple internet connections. The default behavior is going to be round robin. So we're going to use WAN, uh, internet connection one, then internet connection two, then one, then two, then one, then two. Uh, for outgoing traffic. WAN Balancer gives us the ability to control that a little bit more specifically. So we could set it to, for example, uh, if we have uh, a much more, um, a fatter pipe, right? If we have a, an internet connection that has much more bandwidth available to it than our secondary connection, we can use something like 80-20. So 80% of traffic uses the uh, connection that has more bandwidth. 20% uses the connection that has less bandwidth. And that way we can uh, kind of even out the distribution of traffic. And we can also use this to create a kind of primary and backup WAN situation where we set one to 100%, meaning that it's used all the time, and one to 0%, which means that it's never used unless the primary goes down. So the combination of WAN balancer and WAN failover allows us to kind of automatically switch over to a backup uh, internet connection in the event of a failure on the primary. And then we have WAN balancer route rules, which allow us to specify a particular WAN interface, a particular ISP connection for uh, particular devices or certain kinds of traffic. So if you've got a server that you want to always use one particular very low latency internet connection, you can force it to always use that rather than using any of the other available uh, internet connections. Nice. VPN support. Uh, we support IPSEC, OpenVPN, and WireGuard, as you see here. And um, largely, if one is familiar with VPNs, they're basically all the same. They create a route to a remote resource. The differences are going to be IPSEC is the oldest and the most well-adopted. Um, IPSEC is built into everything at this point. Um, other firewalls, you know, Cisco Meraki's, uh, FortiGates, whatever you might have, they all have IPSEC implementations, as well as uh, Windows has a built-in VPN option that is built on IPSEC. Uh, Mac OS, a lot of basically any operating system that has any kind of built-in VPN capability is going to use IPSEC. So it's got that kind of compatibility 
um, and that kind of sort of broad acceptance, which is great. Uh, again, especially if you need to connect uh, connect to something that's not another uh, ETM device or con accept, accept connections from things that aren't other ETM devices. Uh, next up from there is OpenVPN, which is a newer VPN. Uh, it was formed, I want to say, in like 2008, 2009, and is uh, really simple to set up. There is a certificate file that you can download from uh, the NG firewall. You import that into the client, and you're all set. That's the configuration done for you. Whereas IPsec, you've got to go through, if you've ever tried to set up uh, VPN connections from a Windows computer to a remote resource, you've got to enter in IP addresses and protocols, and you have to know all these details. OpenVPN, we give you a file. You import it into the remote client. And you're done. Nice. And so uh, OpenVPN is a lot quicker to set up. It's a lot simpler to use uh, in a lot of cases, but it doesn't have the same um, the same uh, wide adoption as IPsec. So it's not always uh, available for use with site-to-site uh, -site type tunnels where you're connecting two remote networks together um, with devices that aren't other ETM products. And then the new kit on the block is WireGuard VPN. Uh, this is very similar to OpenVPN in that the setup is super straightforward, very, very uh, simplified. But WireGuard was built with speed and performance in mind. The code base for OpenVPN is half a million lines, about 500,000 lines of code. The code base for WireGuard is 5,000 lines. So it's about 1% the size of OpenVPN. And as a result, it has significantly lower overhead. It's much faster and much more performant. And uh, we use it internally ourselves. So um, we, we can kind of give it that uh, dog food stamp of approval. But I tell people if there's if they need a VPN and they don't have a preference, start with WireGuard and work your way back. Um, I like WireGuard best, then OpenVPN, then IPsec, um, sort of in that order. But obviously, you know, depending on the circumstances and uh, compatibility issues and everything, you might sort of have your hand forced into one or the other. Uh, and the VPN option that we do not have listed here that I'll cover very briefly is Tunnel VPN, um, useful for mostly home users. Uh, this is going to allow the NG firewall to connect to a service like NordVPN, ExpressVPN, PIA, any of these kind of anonymizing, privatizing services. And that allows you to effectively connect your whole network to that service rather than a single device. So a lot of, uh, a lot of very privacy conscious folks um, like to use that in the, particularly in their home networks. Nice. So that is an option there. Intrusion prevention pretty much does what it says. And this is one of the places where I tell people install it and walk away. Um, the default settings that we have that we have implemented for this are as um, as secure as we can make this without starting to get into um, things that aren't applicable to all networks or things that might actually cause damage to the network, um, things that might cause problems. So Intrusion prevention comes with 38,000, as of right now, signatures for kinds of behavior. These are going to be DDoS attempts, uh, brute force attempts, attempts to log into admin GUIs via other methods, SQL injections, all kinds of nefarious stuff, right? And so these are looking at, uh, intrusion prevention is looking at traits of this kind of traffic to associate it with these signatures. And then we're going to uh, either block or uh, sometimes log the uh, particular traffic based on... Um, this recommended action. So these signatures come from a third party called Emerging Threats, and this is what they do. They specialize in um, characterizing kinds of behavior that can be used maliciously and nefariously. And uh, their, typically their recommended action is the right thing. Whatever they tell us to do is, is going to be the best um, approach in most cases. And for these, uh, for most of these rules, you're going to see this action is recommended, which is basically you tell us what this what this behavior is, you tell us how it's defined and what to look for, and then you tell us what to do with it. So if you tell us to block it, we'll block it. If you tell us to just keep an eye on it, we'll just put it in the logs and or put it in the reports rather, um, but we'll let it through and so on. And then any installation of intrusion prevention comes with these three rules at the bottom automatically enabled, these memory rules. And this is all the bad stuff that there's no legitimate use for, right? Web app attacks, DDoS, uh, unusual client port connections, uh, things like uh, recons, port scans, um, attempts to log into the admin GUI, things like that. So anything that you really never want to allow into your traffic that's never going to be good. We're going to block all this stuff automatically. And then in very security conscious environments, we can enable some initial rules that will add some additional blocked class types, um, which will be things that are less common um, or less likely to be um, misused. But for the most part, like I said, uh, intrusion prevention is one of my favorite kind of fire and forget apps. Install it and uh, install it, turn it on, and you're good. And IPS does check for um, signature updates pretty pretty frequently, um, usually about four to six times a day. So we're getting um, we're getting those updated signatures, 
really commonly. And so as new kind of attack types and new, you know, bad behavior on the internet uh, starts to come out, then we usually hear about it uh, very, very quickly. And then very briefly, config backup. This is the other side of the cloud backups thing we talked about in ETM dashboard. This allows you to set the time that the backup is generated and sent up to the ETM dashboard. Generally doesn't matter. It's going to be selected at random um, by the app, but you can change it if you want, or you can force an immediate backup, as well as connect to a Google account so that we can send that backup. Uh, in addition to sending it to ETM dashboard, we can also offload it to your own personal Google Drive account. And then finally, we've got Branding Manager. This is a fun one. This lets you change the logo. So where we see Untangle here at the top left-hand corner, we can change that logo as well as some of the information that will be displayed on pages presented to the users like uh, the Captive Portal page, the Web Filter Block page. You know, if you want to say other than contact your network administrator, if you want to say contact John Smith, whomever it might be, you can put that in there um, as well as including some kind of banner messages uh, that'll be a little bit more detailed. Very to kind nice. of strip out uh, some of that some of that branding um, and then live support allows us to um, get support this allows us to actually just create a support ticket directly from the ui so that will send it straight into the support team this is effectively the same as emailing the support team um, but if you're already in the ui anyway it's uh it's pretty easy to uh to do that very convenient absolutely and speaking of convenience one of the other things i'd like to point out is going to be let's say we pop in a threat prevention we've got this get help button. So we click this, this is context aware, and this will take us to the specific documentation for whatever page we're looking at. So we're looking at that, uh, at that threats tab. This takes us right to the threat prevention threats tab so that we can see exactly the documentation that we're looking at, uh, or the documentation specifically to um, what, you know, the screen that we're on. And very briefly, sessions shows us all the traffic that's passing through the NG firewall right now as of the time that the sessions table is either generated or refreshed. The difference between this and reports is this is not historical. So every time I refresh this, you'll see that it changes because um, these are sessions that are active at the moment, whereas reports are historical back to whatever your attention period might be. Hosts shows us IP addresses that are passing traffic through. Uh, in this case, just the local host for some reason is showing up, but uh, every Every IP address that's passing traffic through the NG firewall will appear here in your host table, gives you some information about them, uh, what interface they're connected on, whether they're uh, captured through the captive portal, any tags, and if there's a username associated with it, you'll see that here. Devices is historical. This is every MAC address that has ever passed traffic through this NG firewall. Sometimes you'll see the last seen time is a long time ago. Um, this particular device has not passed traffic through us in a very long time, but we retain this information uh, for posterity, essentially. And then users gives us a little bit of detail about users, uh, whether they are determined by an external source like the Active Directory uh, environment, or uh, we can manually create them. So I can just create a username right here, as well as setting a quota. Um, you know, if I don't want someone to use more than five gigabytes of traffic a day, then I can set that quota right there. And once they have exceeded that quota, we then have a number of options uh, based on kind of what we want to do with them. Whether we want to block access altogether, we can uh, deprioritize their traffic so that they are. Uh, slow down, you know, so they have less bandwidth, whatever it might be. And we can also automatically set up quotas through bandwidth control as well. So that, that's NG Firewall. Um, as I said, that's I, impressive. I, I thank you. It really is. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a big product, a lot of knobs, a lot of, uh, a lot of bells and whistles, tons of features, right? And so it is extremely robust. And um, obviously I am uh as I said, I'm very proud of this product. Um, I think it's really cool. And I think that it does a lot of really cool stuff. So I do like to really kind of get into um, some of the, get into the weeds a little bit um, sometimes with it. But um, if you will indulge me, I would like to take a couple of minutes to run through the micro edge device, which is kind of the younger sibling. I promise it's much faster than the engine firewall uh, demo. No worries. So I'll pop in over here. Uh, I'm going to have to refresh this connection because it's been a while, but let me grab one of these demo units. Uh, Q6WL. So this is our Q6WL appliance, which is pretty cool in that uh, the L indicates that this has LTE backup. So, okay. or not, I shouldn't even say backup. Um, it has an LTE interface. Where are you? There it is. So in addition to um, the wired connectivity that's got, it's connected via it's connected via the Verizon network. So we've got a, a Verizon LTE connection here. Um, we can use this LTE interface as the the only internet connection, um, but obviously it's LTE. So depending on the needs of the network, that might not be uh, ideal. But it makes a great backup interface. Um, 
And then looking here, this uh, a lot of the settings in Micro Edge, as it is, you know, a, a descendant, as it were, of uh, of NG Firewall. Everything's very similar, right? So interfaces are the same. These are your your uh, ISP connections. There is the LTE uh, connectivity. This model has built-in Wi-Fi, so it can serve as a Wi-Fi five access point, as well as VPN tunnels to uh, an AWS environment, and then uh, the CC tunnel. This is the tunnel interface created by the centrally managed VPN that we talked about back in ETM dashboard, the software defined networks. So we've got VPN tunnels that were set up both manually, this AWS thing and the automated one here. And then our internal networks, uh, including this test VLAN. So we do have VLAN supports uh, in both products. DHCP serving, this is, these settings are exactly the same. They just look a little bit different. Uh, if we want to create reservations, we can do them here. These are the existing leases. And there's that handy dandy add static button that we talked about uh, that I couldn't show you in the NG firewall. Um, for DNS uh, stuff, we can do DNS static entries. If there's a device that you want to be able to, that you want the micro edge to be able to uh, resolve DNS by itself without having to restore, re, re, excuse me, to consult with uh, an external DNS server, you can create those static entries here, as well as domain forwarding. If there are particular queries uh, that you want to be able to send to a, to a particular DNS server within an environment. Um, not a lot of use for that in most uh, smaller environments, but we see it a lot in the enterprise uh, sphere. Port forwarding, exactly the same as NG Firewall. There's traffic that exists on the internet that I want to allow in past this micro edge, so we can create those here. Traffic shaping, this is QoS, um, priority setting, very similar to the bandwidth control application in NG Firewall. And then NAT settings if we need to do any kind of NAT stuff. So that brings us to routing. And this is where, and this is where micro edge and NG Firewall diverge pretty significantly because the routing in micro edge is going to be policy based. So we talked about uh, WAN routing on the NG firewall being round robin, or you can use WAN balancer to give it a little bit more granular control. Here in micro edge, we can set up different kinds of policies. So for example, this lowest latency any WAN policy means we're going to test all of our internet connections um, all the time. And whichever one has the lowest latency at any given time will be used for that particular session or we can use a most available bandwidth session so that we're gonna send traffic using whatever WAN has the most bandwidth available to us. Um, lowest latency non-LTE WANs, if we only wanna use that LTE WAN as a backup, um, you know, or, or most available bandwidth, same thing, but we're excluding those LTE connections. So we're only gonna use that LTE if all the other WANs are unavailable. And so the WAN policies essentially allow us to determine which internet connection should be used under what conditions. Okay. So this is kind of half of the sort of intelligent routing portion. The other is going to be WAN rules, which is how we determine what policy, which WAN policy gets applied to particular traffic. So um, for example, we've got this full tunnel one. This is uh, VPN routing. So if, uh, if this packet is coming from uh, LAN number one, then we're going to use the WAN policy, send all traffic to this VPN. So this is VPN routing, right? So we're going to send any traffic coming from LAN one, uh, to this AW across this AWS tunnel, so essentially full tunnel uh, VPN routing. Uh, Verizon DNS, we always want to have uh, Verizon's DNS servers be used for the LTE uh, connections. So whenever you're sending traffic through that LTE connection, we're always going to use the DNS servers that are associated with Verizon for this one, so we can route that particular traffic. And then a very generic one, lowest latency WAN. Uh, any traffic that doesn't meet any of these rules that are above it hits this lowest latency WAN rule. And this one is going to trigger. So we're going to send it through whatever LAN, whatever uh, when it has the lowest lag. So we get pretty granular control over uh, kind of where and when these policies are going to be used and what we're going to do um, with certain kinds of traffic. But overall, typically is going to be used. This is largely going to be used for a kind of a multi-WAN, a multi-inner, uh, multi-ISP kind of configuration. Um, and usually when uh, it, it lets you do, like I said, it lets you get more granular than just 50-50 or than, you know, specific percentages and stuff. You can uh, con configure WAN routing for very specific um, things. Again, one specific device should only use this WAN or even uh, this particular application. So if we identify any traffic belonging to this application, it always uses, the, you know, the, the WAN with the most bandwidth because it's a streaming application or something. And that sort of thing. So those two combinations of uh, policies and rules, that's our kind of adaptive routing. And like I said, super granular, super configurable, um, and very smart. No decision-making uh, required on the part of the admin, especially where we give you a bunch of WAN policies that are defaults that are just going to be the things you're going to want anyway. We want uh, to have a policy for use the lowest latency WAN. Always use the, you know, the biggest pipe that we've got. So those are going to just kind of come standard with it. 
and that is our um, adaptive slash intelligent uh, routing. Really very cool. A lot of people uh, who are using these in multi-WAN environments really love that feature, um, as you can imagine. Okay. Static routes. Static routes are exactly what they sound like. If we need to uh, create routes that are not defined in the micro edge itself, um, typically that would be there is a subnet that is defined downstream of this uh, micro edge, and we need to be able to route between uh, route between it. So we can create those there as needed. Under the firewall heading, filter rules and access rules, these are exactly the same as they are in NG Firewall. Um, filter rules govern traffic that is passing through the uh, micro edge. So this is going to be the rules that we talked about, isolating networks from one another, blocking traffic to particular IP addresses, things like that. Access rules, we didn't cover this with NG Firewall, um, but it's the, the principle is the same. This is traffic that terminates at the appliance itself. So it's going to be incoming VPN connections, uh, DNS requests from downstream, um, attempts to access the admin GUI for the device uh, via the web and that sort of thing. Generally speaking, access rules are, uh, we make them as tight as possible just by default. So usually there isn't a lot that one needs to do uh, in terms of configuration there. And then moving down to services, web filter and threat prevention. These are exactly the same as they are in NG Firewall. Same engine, same uh, same rules, same capabilities, just you know an extra feature that we can add into this uh, more streamlined, uh, more streamlined uh, appliance. And then uh, upgrades. We can, as I said, we can automatically, we can configure automatic upgrades here. Um, this setting takes precedence over the setting in ETM dashboard if they conflict. And uh, we can you know, set it for automatic updates whenever it's convenient. We can turn that off and then manually install upgrades. But the, uh, the convenient thing about MicroEdge, and this is not true about NG Firewall, is you can upgrade from a file, from just an image file. And um, MicroEdge operates essentially entirely in RAM. It's essentially like a RAM disk uh, OS. So when you uh, when you perform an upgrade, you just replace the entire image. There's a settings file that uh, that governs all of the changes that you've made from the default, but the image itself, the core the core OS, gets replaced entirely by the upgrade. We just get you a whole new image. And the good part, uh, or the, the really nice part about that, is it gives you the ability to roll back because you can just upload an older image at any time without losing any kind of functionality or anything like that. Um, it's extremely rare that you would need to do so, um, but sometimes things happen. Um, you know, sometimes things happen with, with upgrades or whatever that might interrupt, uh, you know, uh, connectivity and, and uh, affect productivity and whatnot. Um, sometimes you need to be able to roll back and that is much easier said uh, or much easier done here with micro edge than it is with NG Firewall, which unfortunately requires a full reinstall. And then just some settings specific to uh, the particular device. All right. That... I have taken up so much of your time and your extremely patient listeners' time. So I'm going to disable my screen share here. And uh, whoo, <laughs> that is our product offering. Um, that was very in-depth. Thank you so much. It is, yeah. And like I said, I, I try to I try to rein myself in as best I can, but I get carried away sometimes. So <laughs> this uh, this ran a little bit longer. Uh, this ran a lot longer than I intended to in the initially. But um, you have hung in with me, and I got to show off all the cool stuff. So I'm very happy um, for the opportunity to kind of show everybody around. Well, Graham, what is the number one way if we've got listeners who are interested and in jumping on board and signing up with Arista and getting their toes wet with it, so to speak, and playing around with it, what's the best way they can get started? I would say um, you are welcome to go to our website, edge.arista, A-R-I-S-T-A dot com. Um, and that's got a wealth of information that you can kind of look over. You can contact um, our sales department. They are going to be kind of the jumping off point for a lot of stuff, uh, whether you're okay. considering purchasing, whether you want to do, um, I, I, like I said, I do a lot of demos like this for individual users, and they're typically even more technically in-depth than this one was. <laughs> um, so if, if that's interesting to someone, if they want to see like a really in-depth thing, if they want to kind of talk about, you know, right sizing for their network or uh, capabilities, features and everything, how to, how to use it, how to deploy it, um, I'm happy to help out with that. We also have a team of really, um, of really great sales engineers. Okay. who are capable of, of kind of dealing with that. But yeah, contacting sales is usually going to be the best way to get started with most of that, especially if you have an interest in becoming a partner or an MSP, um, you need to go through them. And you can email sales at edge.sales at arista.com. And like I said, they'll be happy to, um, you know, involve me or involve the SEs if we want to get some demos going. They can help with pricing. They can help with, you know, pretty much anything. 
That's excellent. And for anybody who does reach out to sales, let them know that you watched the demo today and IT business owners group. So, yes, please. I would love to hear uh, you know feedback <laughs> specifically from the listeners. That's perfect. On this one, like I said, I, it it gets a little long winded. That has been that has been uh, brought to my attention. <laughs> once or twice in the past. Uh, but again, I appreciate the opportunity to, um, you know, to kind of demonstrate everything, to show it off and kind of call out some of the, uh, some of the cool features. Sounds great. Well, Graham, thanks again for your time today. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, hope you'll be a guest again on our live stream one, one day coming up soon. I would love to. Thank you so much for the opportunity and your time today, Scott. And uh, the same to your listeners, everyone who's, who's tuned in. Thanks for, uh, for joining us. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.